Very thankful to the Global Food Regulatory Science Society for the invitation and for enabling me to give this uh, introductory talk of this uh, webinar devoted to food fraud. I would like to thank the organizers, including the Platform of Food Regulatory uh, Science and uh, Regulatory Excellence at uh, Université Laval, as well as uh, Arab AOAC and IOFAST for their kind invitation. So this talk is meant uh, to position uh, the uh, two webinars uh, planned uh, by, by GeForce on food fraud and uh, uh, give a general perspective, uh, including on the regulatory management of food fraud after defining and offering uh, some general representations of these uh, incidents. Now, um, food fraud has been witnessed uh, as uh, much or as long as food has been produced and uh, been used uh, as a uh, an entity for commercial value. So essentially, uh, for as long as uh, humans have been uh, trading food products, we have witnessed uh, incidents of food fraud. And uh, this slide offers a representation of the number of commodities that uh, have suffered uh, in uh, the recent past, but even earlier, uh, decades ago, from uh, these uh, phenomenon of uh, food fraud. So uh, olive oil, uh, spices, uh, uh, wine production, juices, or even uh, the uh, sale uh, of uh, fish and fish products. Now, while we continue to discuss uh, a harmonization of the definition of food fraud within the context of the uh, Codex Alimentarius Commission, um, we have witnessed that a number of food regulatory jurisdictions have adopted a definition of food fraud. And uh, uh, while there are some differences, we see some commonalities in these definitions. First of all, food fraud is a deliberate act. So essentially, this is something that some producers who um, intend to do so deliberately do. It is not, for example, the result of environmental contamination or uh, of something that is uh, happening in an adventitious uh, manner. Generally, the objective is economic gain, but mainly for illicit uh, purposes. These incidents are not meant to be discovered, and that's why they're not supposed to produce public health impacts, because generally when that happens, uh, the event is no longer hidden. And also, we can witness situations of food fraud without alteration of the uh, composition of the product. It may simply be related to a misrepresentation of the food product. Now, of course, a number of incidents uh, that have happened uh, in the recent past have put this phenomenon at the forefront uh, of uh, food-related uh, challenges. Um, many of us remember the uh, melamine incident because of the public health impact it resulted uh, into, uh, more than 300,000 illnesses and deaths amongst the most vulnerable subset of the populations witnessed in 2008. The 2013 horse meat scandal uh, and the widespread uh, of uh, this incident amongst uh, over 28 European countries, uh, showing uh, that uh, essentially uh, a number of uh, products um, which were supposed to contain beef were essentially uh, sold containing another species of meat and mainly horse meat, uh, put also this at the forefront. And uh, um, we've seen essentially during this incident a number of regulatory agencies, particularly in Europe and also in North America, consider this as an important issue and taking action to better prevent, manage uh, these situations of uh, food fraud. Now, when we look at the manifestations of food fraud incidents, it spans from uh, the intentional misrepresentation, again, without altering the composition of the food. So essentially, through mislabeling or misrepresentation, uh, for example, uh, presenting um, food from an origin that is different from where the food was sourced, uh, for example, um, introducing different species of meat or different species of fish 
but also altering the weight and the volume of uh, a product. So essentially misrepresenting these values, trying of course to have uh, more gain. Now, generally these incidents do not result in a public health impact. When public health impacts may be foreseen is when we alter the composition of the food. And generally this happens through a possible dilution of the product and then a substitution with the potential to mask that dilution. So of course, when this uh, alteration takes place with the addition of uh, an ingredient that is harmless or that is of a food grade nature, then generally this does not result in the introduction of hazards. But when this alteration takes place with the introduction of a new hazard, we may witness public health impacts, which can be of an acute nature. So for example, either uh, there is an introduction of a high level of a product like what happened with the melamine incident or uh, the introduction of an ingredient that is likely to induce a uh, an acute reaction like the introduction of a food allergen that is not foreseen uh, so for example the dilution of spices uh, with um, peanut um, shells and with the likelihood of the introduction of peanut with the shell as well now, there are situations where the public health impact may be considered as silent because uh, the substance that was introduced uh, as a result of this substitution, uh, for example, the introduction of industrial dyes in order to mask the dilution of uh, spices, this introduction may lead to a chronic risk uh, simply because these substances, for example, may be carcinogenic and at the level that they were introduced, they are not of a nature that would cause an acute uh, risk. Now, when we try to position the way food fraud needs to be managed, uh, considering the codex mandate, which is essentially aiming to protect consumers' health, so essentially with the food safety objective and with a second objective, ensuring fair practices in the food trade, primarily food fraud incidents are meant uh, for the most part to alter the representation of the food and they tend to cover uh, the second mandate of codex. But the minute the food fraud incident results in alteration of the composition of the food with the likelihood to introduce new health risks, then essentially these incidents cease to be hidden. And as a result, essentially, we enter into this, the first mandate of Codex and the management of food fraud will be part of the management of food safety. Now, when we look at uh, the way regulators have attempted to manage this uh, situation, um, we actually travel through time uh, all the way to uh, the 1750 BC, where we find the first texts that have attempted to introduce food laws or at least measures that were meant to deter uh, possibilities of uh, frauding in food production and uh, uh, in fact the Hammurabi code um, was found to be one of the first texts of law that aimed to punish situations of uh, alteration for example of measures and weights related to uh, food production and uh, the um, consequences essentially in those cases were uh, very deterring in the sense that those who were found to be convicted of these crimes uh, would be punished or would uh, face uh, a punishment by drowning, uh, so essentially death by drowning. So you see that the consequences were not small in, in this regard. Now, when we move and fast track uh, quickly to current uh, the current age, we find that a number of food laws find their uh, inception in the management of food fraud. So essentially, before even we started regulating food safety, we look at the contemporary um, texts 
legislating or regulating food, we find that their essence is coming from the management of food fraud incidents, such as, for example, the management of adulteration of alcoholic beverages. And in fact, some of the uh, texts that we have uh, seen in, uh, coming from the Middle Ages, uh, so the uh, Assize of Bread in uh, the 13th century in England, uh, regulated, for example, the price and the weight of bread uh, with fines and prison sentences uh, related to, uh, uh, you know, frauding, so essentially uh, incidents of, of fraud in, in this regard. And uh, um, we looked also at uh, similar situations where uh, in France, uh, there was the introduction of a wine standard, essentially qualifying the quality requirements of uh, wine, which allowed essentially to define incidents or situations which contravened uh, this standard. Now, moving forward to contemporary uh, periods 1860 with the adulteration of food and drinks act in uh, the uh, uk um, and in the british empire with the intent essentially to protect consumers from imported products and um, mostly focusing um, to whole seller in 1872, um, we've seen the introduction of the Adulteration of Food and Drugs Act with an authority given to regulators to take samples and also with the attribution of responsibility to producers and wholesalers in the way these incidents are to be managed. Uh, the introduction of standards of identity was identified as a tool to help preserve uh, the authenticity of food products and better protect consumers. And uh, the 1890 amendment um, that was introduced in Canada permitted essentially government to create standards to define the characteristics of a food. And these standards became part of regulations. And in fact, the first Canadian standard was developed in this regard uh, for tea. Unfortunately, this was not further uh, generalized to other uh, food products simply because it was not afforded uh, by regulators. Now, when we try to regulate these uh, incidents of food fraud, we tend to focus on the potential impacts that happen as a result of these incidents. And these impacts can be, in fact, of a low risk nature, where we see that mainly um, the main impact is an economic impact, meaning that the consumer is cheated and ends up paying more for a product that is of a lesser quality. But there are potentials for increased risk and we see essentially that when uh, these incidents are either repeated or they tend to be discovered with a potential health impact, we may see, of course, uh, an increase of the impact moving to a potential loss of confidence uh, of consumers and a loss of trust in the way foods are produced, all the way to significant health and safety impacts, essentially leading to public health issues, like essentially was the case with the melamine uh, incident. And of course, if we are to uh, impose measures that are commensurate to the level of risk that is witnessed as a result of food fraud, we see that um, regulators have adopted also an incremental approach uh, in the way these incidents are to be managed. Um, moving from a reactive approach, essentially um, most of the food laws that we witness internationally would have provisions that are meant to protect consumers from misrepresentation. And these are meant primarily uh, to, for example, prevent situations of misrepresentation, for example, of uh, uh, products of different origin, different species, different weights, different volumes, moving to a stronger set of penalties when the impacts are bigger either as a result of repeat offenses or because these impacts may lead to public health repercussions. And in this regard, when these impacts tend to be higher, it is very important that the framework moves from a reactive approach to a preventive approach. Preventive approach meaning to the development of instruments that would allow to predict these situations, uh, 
to identify indicators of their occurrence and therefore to mandate requirements by producers to uh, avoid these incidents from happening in the first place. So essentially through the introduction, for example, of vulnerability assessments and the identification of potential risks uh, resulting from these incidents with uh, taking the appropriate measures from preventing their occurrence in the first place. Now, in general, the way food fraud would be uh, or would need to be managed could be mirroring approaches that uh, are adopted for food safety. So, of course, uh, in prerequisite programs, um, looking at the way, for example, suppliers uh, are identified and are managed, but also through the development of specifically targeted preventive approaches that uh, are dedicated to the prevention of food fraud incidents. Of course, uh, traceability uh, would support a better reactivity when uh, situations of food fraud are identified, and essentially there is a widespread of those. Having the appropriate traceability mechanisms would allow to limit and to mitigate those incidents. Now, of course, when we look at the current focus uh, that is being applied by food producers and uh, on um, the direction that is provided by food regulators, the focus is on preventive tools. And this is uh, where a number of food safety and quality management systems, particularly those uh, that are advocated by the third party assurance programs, uh, those uh, proprietary food safety and quality schemes, such as the BRC, the IFS, uh, the SQF, or uh, those uh, systems that are benchmarked against the uh, Global Food Safety Initiative. Uh, these systems have developed a number of tools useful to assess vulnerability of the supply chain and to identify some early markers for the potential introduction of food fraud in the supply chain and therefore the development of mitigation tools that would prevent uh, these incidents from happening or that would help, in fact, mitigate their impacts. Now, um, uh, of course, another set of tools that would be extremely useful for uh, those who are interested in managing food fraud, both from the regulatory standpoint as well as uh, from the supply chain, is the availability of food analytical uh, methods and uh, uh, the reliance on methods that can uh, support uh, to confirm authenticity of value-added products or the determination of markers of fraud uh, are essentially key elements in the arsenal to combat food fraud. And that's why AOAC International has devoted some efforts in the harmonization of non-targeted methods, as well as targeted methods uh, that are known to identify some known markers of adulteration. Now, of course, in all this, uh, we need a number of uh, developments and progress. Uh, mainly, um, there are some efforts that need to be uh, devoted to a better convergence of the methodologies and approaches that are used for vulnerability assessment. We have various tools and therefore various methods. A number of these approaches are not necessarily accessible, so they're not open access. A number of those also are not necessarily adaptable to uh, small and medium enterprises. Uh, for laboratory methods, continued effort in standardization and harmonization of methods uh, is needed. And of course, uh, continued discussion amongst uh, the regulatory community for better harmonization of the requirements to be imposed on food producers in order to prevent and mitigate food fraud are needed, particularly under the auspices of the Codex Alimentarius Commission. Now, the organizers of this uh, webinar or some of the organizers of this webinar, such as uh, Université Laval's Food Risk Analysis and uh, regulatory excellence platform, the Institute of Nutrition and Functional Food, as well as a number of industry partners and AOAC International uh, attempted to contribute over the past period through the organization of a number of workshops under uh, the name of Global Understanding of Food Fraud, uh, attempted essentially to bring together uh, a coalition of stakeholders 
fostering collaborative efforts and the creation of a global coalition of thought leaders in order to help uh, manage uh, food fraud. And uh, amongst the areas of focus that were identified through these efforts, uh, the need to continue to invest for collaborative uh, leadership amongst food regulators and more convergence of uh, guidance and requirements. Uh, the continued uh, development of more applicable tools and guidance to industry in order to uh, assess the vulnerability of the supply chains and take the appropriate actions when those vulnerabilities are identified, and also further investment in the development of analytical methods and their standardization, and this is where the leadership of AOAC International is required. Um, at the regulatory level, continued effort and continued work under the CC Fix and the Codex Alimentarius Commission will hopefully contribute to more uh, convergence of uh, guidance to industry and uh, regulatory requirements uh, in this area. Now, a number of tools will help facilitate that. Uh, of course, the availability of intelligence gathering and early identification uh, tools of these incidents learning from these incidents from food fraud incidents once they are documented and once their levers are well understood uh, further development and dissemination of uh, vulnerability assessment and management tools again i mentioned the analytical methods but also efforts of risk communication and better education of uh, consumers ensuring again that consumers maintain their confidence in the food supply this all requires collaborative approaches, uh, gathering government organizations, regulators, industry, academic institutions, as well as consumer organizations. And a number of facets of these efforts will be further discussed during the course of this uh, webinar and during the course of these uh, couple of days organized by the Global Food Regulatory Science Society and its, uh, part, uh, and its partners. Once again, I'm very thankful to the organizers of uh, this event for uh, including me to uh, open up the discussions and hopefully this helped uh, position this issue and their challenges and will help further the debate with our upcoming speakers thank you very much